For all of you who are joining us electronically, welcome. We're blessed to have you with us. May God's light shine in your heart as you hear this message today. On a cold, early spring morning, a handful of New York City teenagers stole a boat. See, there's this large pond in the middle of Central Park where people rent rowboats by the hour and paddle around. It's fun, it's peaceful, it's romantic, and it's also expensive, especially for teenagers who grow up in the city with not very much. But it is worth trying at least once, legally. Anyway, one morning, long before the rental place opened, these teenagers crept along the water line, grabbed a rowboat, and pushed out into the pond. One of the group really wanted to try rowing the boat. He'd never done it before, and so he badgered his friends into letting him try. He couldn't row to save his life, and his friends let him know it. They razzed him unceasingly, and they laughed as he grew more and more upset because it made him row even worse. That's the fun of making fun of somebody, isn't it? Eventually, he had had enough. And so, grabbing the oars, he shouted, That's it! I'm going to teach you a lesson! He pushed the oars out into the water stranding himself and his friends in the middle of a cold, dark, and dirty pond. Did I mention that this was Central Park in the middle of New York City? Did I mention that police cars occasionally patrol the entire park? And now here they were, right out in the open, in a stolen rowboat. What now? And by the way, the story is not about me. It doesn't involve me at all. I've done other things in Central Park that you will never hear about. But this was not me. See, a friend of mine who went to a different school told me this story about a friend of his, somebody he knew. Actually, he might have heard it from a guy who knew these guys. Because my friend wasn't involved either. And I don't even know if this is a true story, so, but it probably is. Either way, it wasn't me. Every now and then, I, I think we all find ourselves up a creek or on a pond or out in the middle of the ocean without a paddle. And when we find ourselves having a lost, uncertain, dangerous, wilderness experience, we may get stuck thinking about what to do next. And like our band of teenaged miscreants, the specter of capture, detention, humiliation, job loss, broken relationships, some negative consequence may loom if we do not decide. What path shall we follow? Where shall we turn? Well, as a people of faith, let's give thanks that we have God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit to guide us as we navigate the turbulent waters of life. God has given us Pillars of clouds and fire. Everlasting signposts to guide us through life. Let's follow them together. We're spending the next few weeks pondering how the Holy Spirit works in our lives. Two weeks ago, we began with the very beginning of the book of Genesis. And we learned that the Holy Spirit precedes everything. 
Even before the first light shines in the darkness, the Holy Spirit hovers over the unformed waters. Before our first breath, God is. Last week, also in Genesis, we read a short passage about Noah and the flood. And we learn that even as we go through dark and stormy times, the Holy Spirit precedes us even there, clearing away the troubled waters in which we find ourselves. And so this time, we read from the book of Exodus. Now this book is 40 chapters long. We could spend one chapter a week for most of a liturgical year and still never scratch the surface of all the wisdom and drama and epic adventure within. But this time we will pick up with the Hebrews as they enter a wilderness moment of their own. The plagues have passed. The Spirit of the Lord has passed through Egypt and Pharaoh has finally released them from the bondage of slavery. And so together they seek out the promised land, the land promised to the descendants of Abraham. Now they could trace their way up the Mediterranean coastline, which is a shorter path, but God sends them on another. Let's now read the book of Exodus, chapter 13, verses 17 through 22. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although that was nearer. For God thought, if the people face war, they may change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people by the roundabout way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of the land of Egypt and prepared for battle. So Moses took with him the bones of Joseph, who had required a solemn oath of the Israelites, saying, God will surely take notice of you, and then you must carry my bones with you from here. They set out from Sukkot and camped at Etam, on the edge of the wilderness. The Lord went in front of them in a pillar of cloud by day, to to lead them along the way, and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light, so that they may travel by day and by night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. The word of God for the people of God, and the people of God say, thanks be to God. Okay, so the Hebrews have escaped captivity and they now enjoy the freedom to worship and live together in whatever way God calls them. And yet in this moment, questions arise. Where do we go? How do we get there? How shall we feed our families along the way? When will we finally find a place that we can call home? In other words, yay, we're free! Now what? Sometimes it's okay to sit with uncertainty, but not for long. Now remember, we're still stuck in the rowboat, okay, with those teenagers, and the police are coming soon, any minute. We haven't gone anywhere yet. I mean, and even if we could row, to which bank should we row? Which direction is going to keep us out of trouble? If only the teens had a pillar to guide them. God is so gracious, so amazingly gracious to guide the Hebrews away from danger, 
even if they have to linger in the wilderness for a time. Remember that later on, the Hebrews lose their faith and yearn for captivity in Egypt when they get hungry. And then after that, they lose their faith again when they get thirsty. They lose their faith yet again when they crave meat. Imagine what they'd yearn for in the face of armed resistance, especially at the very beginning of their journey. But God cares about the well-being of God's people and so steers them away from trouble. And God provides an everlasting guide for the Hebrews to follow. A pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And neither the cloud nor the pillar ever abandons God's people. What a comfort those pillars must have been. Standing as perennial signs of God's loving care. About this story, our founder, John Wesley, writes, They need not fear missing their way, those who were thus led, nor being lost, those who were thus directed. They need not fear being benighted, who were thus illuminated, nor being robbed, who were thus protected. And they who make the glory of God their end, and the word of God their rule, and the spirit of God the guide for their affections, and the providence of God the guide of their affairs, may be confident that the Lord goes before them as truly is he went before Israel in the wilderness. This is what makes me so happy to call the United Methodist Church my home, my spiritual home, my home in Christ. Wesley always writes about the grace, the providence, the justice, and the everlasting love of God. And Wesley echoes Christ's command that we embody God's love in our love of neighbor. All our neighbors. God, Christ, the Holy Spirit, and our scriptures all serve as our pillars of cloud and fire. Our everlasting guides by which we can travel through life growing in our love and knowledge of God. But let's not leave here without understanding one key thing. Yes, absolutely, God cares about each and every one of us as individuals. But God also cares about all of us as a people. Unlike other societies around this planet, which emphasize the good of the collective over the good of the individual, we in the U.S. emphasize the liberty of the individual, sometimes over the good of the collective. And while the Bible highlights some really amazing individuals, like Moses, it highlights these individuals and their lives within the grander story of the community, the people of God. In our faith, we as individuals play a part in a grander, greater drama. And as Jesus teaches, we achieve greatness when we humble ourselves and strive for the good of all. We serve not just, as our, not just ourselves. Now, the, a biblical clue here comes right from our story in Exodus. In the verses we read, we see two names for God, not just one. One word for God, 
used here is Elohim. It's a plural name. It's a name that means rulers, judges, magistrates. But the word for the Lord here is YHWH, which we typically pronounce Yahweh. Of course, in biblical Hebrew, the vowels are missing in the actual text. So we may not, this may or may not be entirely accurate. We just have to know what the vowels are. We're not sure at this point. And we're really not supposed to say YHWH anyway. In any case, YHWH is singular. And it means self-existent. So in this passage, God's name is both singular and plural. And so God guides Moses and the people of God along the path through the wilderness. In other words, God not only seeks our individual good, but the good of all the people. And ours is a faith of individuals within the context of community. We all have a role to play in God's epic drama. Let's keep this in mind in our prayer life and as we go about our affairs this week. Let's keep this in mind in our places of business and in our associations. Let's keep this in mind with our families and our circles of friends. We all have a part to play in a grander story. Let's use the individual freedom we enjoy to strive for the good of all. And as I mentioned earlier, in Christ, and in the Holy Spirit, and in our Scriptures, God has given us unbreakable pillars of faith that can guide us through the dark oceans and rocky terrains of life. When we pray, when we meditate upon our Scripture, when we engage in some form of ministry, and when we, with a trusted circle of faithful friends, ask one another that age-old Wesleyan question, how is it with your soul? Well, hopefully, these pillars will help us to navigate the seas of life more smoothly. But even when the seas get rough, we have these pillars of faith that can help us to steady our course, find our way home. If only our merry band of teenage rowboat thieves had such pillars to guide them. Perhaps they wouldn't have stolen a rowboat and gotten themselves stuck in a garbage-filled pond in the first place. And that's exactly how they had to escape their predicament. They stuck their hands into this cold, algae-filled, yucky pond water and paddled themselves to shore. They left the rowboat behind them and escaped to tell this story to their friends. Again, not me. Okay. I know the more I deny it, the more you think it was me, but... And here's the thing. See, if kids, especially kids who cannot afford to rent a rowboat in Central Park, want to have the experience of, of rowing a boat, I wish we as a people could afford kids like them the opportunity to row a boat and a lot of other opportunities while we offer them the pillars of our faith. And actually, believe it or not, we at Trinity can do that very thing. After taking last year off, in the first week of July, we will be sending a handful of kids to Warren Willis Camp in Fruitland Park for a week of fishing and archery and ropes courses and campfires and, yes, rowing a boat. And the kids will worship 
and do daily devotions and explore their faith together in a safe and friendly environment. It is a blessing that our Florida Annual Conference offers this experience for young people across Florida, and they also offer scholarships to students of limited means. This is a real blessing to our world. And so I'd like to cast a vision for us here at Trinity for the coming year. Actually, I want to lay it down as a challenge. This year we're sending five kids to camp, maybe six, if a spot can open up for her. But next year, I'd like us to send 12. And the year after that, I'd like us to send 24. Now how we're going to do this, I'm not sure yet. But one thing I do know is that God has sent us pillars of faith. And the Holy Spirit will guide us to accomplishing this goal if we set our intention to invite and welcome young people into Trinity. Let's see what we can do to help families in our immediate area grow in their love of God and neighbor. Let us all serve as pillars of cloud and fire for everyone. Sound good? Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, thank you for this day. Thank you for your wisdom in your holy word. And thank you for your son, Jesus, and thank you for the power and freedom and energy of your Holy Spirit. God, we thank you for our fathers and our fathers in faith. We thank you for all who have helped us to become the faithful people we are today. And so, God, we pray that your Holy Spirit will work on our lives to help us form the faith of those who come after us. May they come to believe in you and love you as much as we love you. And God, we thank you for your son, Jesus, who came into this world out of your love, who taught us, who healed us, who fed us, who rescued us, who welcomed us when no one else would, and who gave of himself on the cross that we might be forgiven of our sin, and whom you have raised up as a sign, a pillar, an everlasting, unbreakable pillar of your eternal life and love. 